so here we are with column span of A belonging to the image of B, right. So suppose uh, what vector should I now consider? Some exotic symbols maybe. So xi, okay. Let xi belong to the image of P. Therefore, there exists zeta, okay, such that xi is equal to P zeta. Yeah. So what I, what do I have to show? I am trying to show containment. So I started with something in the image of P. I want to show that it belongs to the column span of A. But is that not really trivial? Because now this is nothing but A times A transposed A inverse A transposed xi. And focus your attention on this object. What is this? Let's call this okay, not so exotic, just poor old y. What is this y? One is, it's a vector of the appropriate size, of course. So this y is what? What do you mean by this? If you have a xi that, will, that can be written as a y, then it obviously belongs to column span of A, is it not? Yeah. The other side is, that might look a little long winded, but it's even more simple to check. So now, next we suppose, Suppose, okay, let us just say V. I am tired of those symbols. So, let V belong to column span of A. It means V is equal to AW for some W. I am not even talking about the sizes of those. You already know from the size of A, which is M cross N, what the sizes of V and W ought to be. W is an N tuple. V is an M tuple. Yeah, that is all clear. So now, look at PV. Can you guess what is the intuition behind this? I already know that if something is a projection, then it maps fellows in the, within the subspace to themselves. So if I can show that something that is in the column span is projected back to itself, I will be done, which is the premise behind looking at this object. I should be able to show that this is nothing but V itself, right. So this is going to be A, A transposed, A inverse, A transposed and what about V now? It is A W, A W. So again, this A transposed A gets pulverized by this inverse here. So this is nothing but A W, but A W is nothing but V, just as required, yeah. So therefore, V definitely belongs to the image of P. And therefore, from here I have image of P contained inside column span of A. And from here I have column span of A contained inside image of P. So based on these two observations, of course, I might as well conclude that column span of A is equal to the image of P. So, column span of A, so U is equal to column span of A is equal to image of P. The final thing is the kernel. What is the kernel of the column span? Every vector that is perpendicular to the columns. 
So how do we represent such a vector? Once we have the matrix with its columns already sitting as these vectors, these stacked up tall vectors, do we not write it as some x transpose, let's not call it x, let's call it z transposed a is equal to 0 or in other words a transposed z is equal to 0. So the kernel of a transposed, yeah. So what we have to essentially show is that the kernel of a transposed or we have to check that the kernel of a transposed is equal to what? What? Because the kernel of A transposed is exactly the orthogonal complement of the column span of A. Do you agree with this? This is a pivotal step. What am I saying? I am saying that if you have Z transposed A is equal to 0 implies and implied by Z belongs to kernel of a transposed and this is true right just take the transposed on both sides so this is basically a transpose z is equal to 0 so therefore this is the kernel and what I am also saying is that z is perpendicular to column span of a is it not by the very definition this is the inner product z's inner product with individual columns of a must lead to 0 for this to be a 0 row vector. Now every such z belongs to kernel of A transpose. Therefore kernel of A transpose must be the orthogonal complement of the column span of A. Right. This is clear. So if this is clear then this proof, this last property, just checking this last property reduces to just checking this. Agreed? So how do we go about this? It is actually very straightforward even though it might appear a little daunting at first glance. Again, let Z belong to kernel of A transposed. It means A transpose Z is equal to 0. But it also means that A transpose A whole inverse a transposed z is equal to 0 with an a ahead of it. Of course, if this part is already 0, if you pre multiply it with this, yeah, implies z belongs to kernel of p because this is after all my p. So, one part of the inclusion is very straightforward that kernel of a transposed is contained inside kernel of p. The other part might appear a little tricky, but once you observe certain things here, so let, what should I call this now, mm, W belong to kernel of P, which means that A, A transposed A inverse A transposed W is equal to 0. But what do we know about A? Full column rank. If A has full column rank, let us concentrate on this and call this, what should I call it? P. So this implies A P is equal to 0. But when is that possible? Since A has full column rank, this is only possible if P is equal to 0, it has a trivial kernel, full column rank. So P is equal to 0. If P is equal to 0, then this object that I have put on, uh, under the, with this under brace here must be 0. So this means A transposed A, the whole inverse times A transposed W must be equal to 0. What, what else do we know? This is an invertible matrix. Of course, it's written in terms of an inverse. So again, let me call this Q. 
This means A transposed A inverse Q is equal to 0, right? Which obviously leads to the conclusion that Q must be equal to 0 now, yeah? Which means Q is equal to 0. But what is Q? Q is nothing but A, a transpose W, which means that only those objects, even though this matrix came as a result of several pre-multiplications, but because of the full column rank and the invertibility of the corresponding matrices such as A and A transpose A inverse, only those objects which belong to the kernel of A transposed also manage to be in the kernel of this projection matrix and nothing else but that. Yeah. So these kind of tools, I'm pretty sure you will find them handy in several other arguments, not just in this context. When you have uh, multiple matrices multiplying one another and you have, of course, if the rightmost fellows kernel contains something, then that belongs to the kernel of the overall product. But when is that the only sort of fellow that contains, that is contained in this? If the fellows to the left of them keep having full column rank, if you can piece them together and they all have full column rank, then at no point can you break this or split it up and say that, oh, hang on, there is some non-zero vector for which this can vanish. It cannot because they all have full rank. So if you keep multiplying full column rank matrices one after another, and then the last fellow is probably short of that full column rank, then that's all that you can do, right? It's only the kernel of the last fellow. That'll be the kernel of the overall matrix. A very general observation just from this. Right? Which means that Q, sorry, uh, W belongs to kernel of A transposed. So if you have something in the kernel of A transposed, it's in the kernel of P. If you have something in the kernel of P, it must be in the kernel of A transposed. So even this property is verified. Okay. What about the orthogonality? Something we haven't spoken about. We call this a projection. Is it really doing what we want it to do? That is, is it really cooking up this B hat in a clever way so that this B minus B hat is indeed in the orthogonal complement of the column span? Yeah? So we'll just go ahead and take that inner product to check. Okay. So B minus B hat inner product with what is how can you represent an object that lives inside the column span of A as some A V right yeah so this is going to be equal to B minus recall this was A A transposed A inverse a transpose B, its inner product with A V, which is nothing but V transposed A transposed B minus V transposed A transposed A into A transposed A, the whole inverse into A transposed B. Once again, this A transpose A and A transpose A inverse lead to identity. So you have V transposed A transpose B minus V transposed A transpose B, which is zero as required, right? So you could have come at it from this approach as well to show that this is indeed the best approximation. But then we also wanted to reveal to you the fact that this matrix which you might have come across earlier also in some preliminary courses on linear algebra where you talk about pseudo inverses and stuff. This is also an example of a projection map. Projection map is of course the generalization of this notion over abstract vector spaces. But when you're talking about tangible Euclidean spaces then this matrix, the projection map becomes a matrix of this form. Before we conclude, because this is going to really uh, put the seal on the first part of our course, which is the solution of AX is equal to B. I'm just going to quickly summarize what are the possibilities that you might encounter. One is AX is equal to B is a square system. 
in that case what do you do? If A is invertible, just go ahead and invert it, something you have been doing since your um, I do not know plus 2 or even before that, yeah we have done that, great. Next, if you have as in this case more number of experiments than the number of unknowns to be determined, you have a tall matrix, an over determined system. If you have full column rank, this is great. Suppose you do not have full column rank, do you stop? Maybe it is an ill designed experiment, there is some dependence in the parameters. What do you do? Well, you can always say go back to the physics and rectify it and give me a uh, tall matrix with full column rank, that is one way, but let us say that is what is done is done. What do you do then? The idea should be very obvious now, you still go ahead and look for the basis for the column span. So, maybe all the columns are not linearly independent, but the column span is a vector space after all, finite dimensional vector space sitting inside Rm. So, it definitely has a basis. So, pluck out suppose the rank of that matrix is R. So, you pluck out R linearly independent columns that gives you a basis for the column span. What is the next idea? Once you have the column span, what do you need to do? You have a basis for the column span, perhaps orthogonalize it using Gram Schmidt. Yeah, I am talking about computationally efficient technique. See, I am talking about a lot of things because this is an application, but I mean, if I take it down as an example, it will take like maybe a lecture, one hour for me to calculate here on board. But the idea is simply this you do not stop, you take the R linearly independent columns that span the column span. So, if you have a any basis in an inner product space, we have seen you can have Gram Schmidt orthogonalization to get an orthogonal basis corresponding to that basis. And once you have an orthogonal basis, it is beautiful because now you have to just take this vector B and take its inner product with this orthonormal set and that gives you the best possible projection approximation, right? That is it. So, there is a very beautiful way of doing that which you will see later, maybe not in this course. I will see if we have time, but there is something called singular value decomposition, which gives you these orthogonal basis for the kernels and these images, okay. Shouldn't there be a choice of basis vectors which we should be? Done? No, it does not matter. You can choose any of those out of those uh, m, sorry, n columns, you pluck out any r linearly independent fellows, you will still live inside the same space because there are no more than r linearly independent. You, you take your poison or your reward, whichever r you want to. You may not be able to choose all possible n choose r because some of those will probably be trivial choice. If you have repeated columns for instance, whether you choose this one or that one in your set matters not. So, that is the idea, right. So, you pluck out this vectors that span the column span, do this Gram Schmidt procedure to orthonormalize them and once you if you have to orthogonalize them, you have to just normalize them and divide them by their norm. If you have not ortho normal, if you have orthonormalized them already, just go ahead and take the inner product of the B, the, un, the, the, the vector on the right hand side with each of these basis vectors. No matter what basis you choose or what basis your friend chooses, you will still come up with this because the best approximation you see is unique, right. Okay, great. So, all this is great. So, this even if it is not full column rank, we have outlined what you can do. So, for a square matrix, invertible, great. Not invertible, what can you do? Again, same idea. Best approximation, what can you do? If the rank of a squared n squared n, n cross n matrix is R, you still have at least R of those columns that are linearly independent. Again, go ahead and pluck out those R columns. It is nothing different from that, right. And then based on those R columns that you have picked out, again you can do the Gram Schmidt orthogonalization and take the inner product of this vector on the right hand side and that is the best possible thing you can do. You are asked to uh, match this vector here with vectors on this table here. You cannot obviously match it. The best you can do is you can just take several fellows that are on an orthogonal basis and take the inner products and see that that is it. Now, suppose you have a fat matrix or a wide matrix as the case may be with full row rank. We know that in such cases solutions exist, but the multiple solutions may exist. So, in that case uh, the problem becomes 
uh, a little more open-ended depending on the application. So you might want to say, oh, hang on, these are my unknown coefficients x1 through. So if it's n cross, or sorry, m cross n, where n is greater than m. Yeah, so you have n parameters now and you've performed m experiments which are fewer than, far fewer than the n parameters. But there are certain parameters that you, let's say, you say, oh, I know from this, they're very small, negligible, close to zero, and so on. So you have to use your domain specific knowledge there. That is why, you know, even if it's applied linear algebra, I cannot go into every possible domain. It's domain specific knowledge at work there. You have to be smart about what kind of a solution you will choose. The solution is obviously going to be non-unique for a full row rank matrix. The solution is obviously going to be non-unique. It's always going to exist. Some solution is going to exist because the column span is then the entirety of Rm and it's got more columns then. So any vector in Rm that you choose, like this B vector to uh, B, it can always be matched. But the problem is now there is non-uniqueness. So out of these non-unique, infinite possible choices that you can have, you know, you can add any uh, constant times the vectors in the kernel. And those will also be a solution in this case. Because there will always be free variables, remember, when you have a wide matrix. So then you have to optimize it. If, on the other hand, you're really rotten luck and you end up with a wide matrix, which is not even full row rank. I would say it's a very badly designed experiment and probably you should go back to the drawing board, but let's say you end up with it. Then what do you do? Now you again get back to this problem. Just because it's a wide matrix doesn't mean a solution is guaranteed unless it's full row rank. So if it's full row rank, wide matrix, multiple solutions, that's one sort of problem. Not full row rank. Again, we are back in the same domain. So it's the short of the number of rows. So now you have to again look at the column span. It's not going to be the entirety of Rn. Sorry, Rm, because there are m rows there. So it's not the entirety of Rm. It's some subspace of Rm, which is the column span. So again, you have to go back and try and approximate this and get the best possible approximation. Right? So in case it's already there in Rm, in, in the subspace, this B vector is already there in the column span, despite the column span being deficient, it's already there in this, right? So then what do you do? Okay, anyway, then it essentially means if you go to the row reduced echelon form, some of those equations devolve to zero is equal to zero. Just get rid of those equations. And you have full row rank again. See what I'm saying? If you have a wide matrix with less than full row rank, but the right hand side, the B vector sitting in the right hand side is still in the column span. Then carry out the row reduced echelon form operations, go back to the RREF and you'll see that on, you'll have some zero rows on the left hand side and some zero entries on the right hand side exactly matching them. So those equations anyway become immaterial. And you have now R cross N system of equations where R is the rank. Now you're again in the domain of full row rank. So I hope that the reason why I uh, lingered a bit on this discussion is I hope that with this, if you encounter any kind of situation with real or complex matrices, <laughs> because those are exactly the kind of things we call as inner product spaces, Rns and Cns, any real or complex problem of the form Ax is equal to B, if you're asked to solve for them, right, because you're living inside an inner product space, you should not say there is a solution, there is a unique solution, there are multiple solutions, there is no solution and that's it, I'm done. If the application demands that you go ahead and push your luck and see what's the best possible solution, you should know what the best possible solution is, right? So that is the idea. With that, we have brought to a close our discussions on Ax is equal to B. A lot of the discussions we've had, this hyperplanes, these affine sets, they're all predicated essentially on this understanding of Ax is equal to B. Because remember, we've spoken about this hyperplanes right? Right at the beginning, like each of those equations is like a hyperplane, no? Hyperplane with a bias. What do you think that is? That is like a coset, right? Like those cosets that we discussed as the quotient space, the objects in the quotient space. Each of those equations is like an object in the quotient space, right? And it is in this light that you should see how that first isomorphism theorem also reflects on the rank nullity theorem in case you have finite dimensions, right? And those things can be represented as matrices. So in the next lecture, we will probably discuss a few more applications of inner products before we close this topic entirely and we
make a paradigm shift into a completely different topic which is the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and will motivate the importance of that problem. Thank you.